It doesn't necessarily mean physical bodily removal or absence. It means you are a kept person. You're not reckoned with the so-called earth dwellers. You're not of the men, the sensuality of the men of the earth. You are a person of the spirit. And so you, this day will not take you as a thief. It's almost, yeah, I know it doesn't use the word thief here. It does in other places. But the same concept is there. The day will not take you unawares. It will not come upon you as a trap, but it will come upon the earth dwellers as a snare. So it's not talking necessarily about bodily removal. First of all, even if it was, it wouldn't necessarily mean a pre-trib rapture. But what it's evidently talking about is this unparalleled deception and enduring to the end and not being taken away by the strong delusion because it's going to take a miracle of divine grace to escape the kind of deception that the Lord warns of. Not only is it a time like no other and a, and a tribulation like no other, according to the Luke 21, Matthew 24, it's a deception like no other. So that... Can you tell yeah. us the verse, uh, Reggie? In Luke 21? Matthew. Oh, in Matthew 24, I think it's 22. There'll be a false cry. It says, first of all, he starts the Olivet Prophecy, his very first response, which I think is very significant. What will be the sign you're coming into the end of the world? He uses almost the exactly the same language we'll hear later in 2 Thessalonians with Paul. He says, take heed that no man deceive you. And there's no other theme that he returns to more often and reiterates more than the issue of deception. I think it's used you know. six times in Matthew 24, the word really? decept- yeah. deceiver, deception. There you have it. So, so, and even after the abomination, even after whatever that is, and we'll look at what that is, but whatever it is, even after that, the church is still being sifted, even in its wilderness flight, by false apostles and prophets. And the scripture uses a curious language. It says, they will come in my name saying, I am Christ. Well, listen, if somebody comes and says, hey, I'm the Messiah, that's not going to nearly deceive the very elect, right? But these are going to be people that come acknowledging that Jesus is, in fact, the Messiah. That's what he mean. it means. Mm-hmm. And they're going to come when it says false Christ will arise. It doesn't mean that people are going to come and say, I'm, I'm the Messiah. It means false anointings. The word, the word Christ there is nothing other than the Greek word um, well, it's the same word that we have in um, Hebrew. It's, it's, it's a, the word for anointing. What's well, the word for Christ? Mashiach. It's the, yeah, Mash, Mashiach. Mashiach. It's Mashiach and, and Christos, I believe, or something. But it's, it's the word for anointing. It's false anointings. Many false anointings will come. He uses the word singer. It didn't say the Christ, but many false anointings will come and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they would deceive the elect. And they'll be saying, low here or low there. There's going to be those who come and say, well, we're the elite group that's going to have a special rendezvous. And we'll go to this secret chamber. We'll be out in the desert. Deception of all kinds will still plague the church right up to the very end. Scary, but it's it's a sobering thing. um, Well, anyhow, the bottom line here is it's amazing. Do you guys see that this is Jesus, the, the, the glorified Jesus, using the very language that only Luke records? And here John... Probably with, we don't know for sure, but he may not even have known the book of Luke. And he's quoting verbatim, this is the risen son of God. And I thought, what do you scholars do with that one? I mean, it was, <laughs> it's amazing. To me, that's yeah. edifying. It's so, it's like, wow, you know. Yes, amen. This is actually Jesus talking to John, amen. using the language he used to use. And it's not even characteristic of John's usual language. You know, because you can read the book of Revelation, you read the gospel of John, you know, it's the same guy. Yeah. This is the, the language he uses is very common, unlike Luke or Matthew. But when it comes to Revelation 3.10, t- it's verbatim right out of Luke 21. It's Jesus. Ah, oh, it's powerful. <laughs> yeah, man, here's, uh, some of you might know this. There's already, there's a guy in Portland, Oregon. He has his radio station. He's on on Sundays, and he says he is Jesus Christ. And he calls him the, the Holy One and himself that. And then there's also... A, Black brother on a TV that claims to be the Messiah. Also, and these people were—I mean, people were calling in and asking questions, and he you know, he's answering. Well, we, we knew a guy, uh, I won't give his name, but it was a group of people. They had a communities all the way from Alaska, the Yukon, down to South America, and he would say, "I'm Christ." And what he meant was, "I'm in such union with that anointing. I am that." And who, when you're hearing me now, you're hearing him, and that kind of stuff. So they don't exactly. I'm not Jesus the Messiah, but I'm, I'm the equivalent. And so, yeah, that also, and I think we're going to see more of that, Matt. I appreciate you bringing that out because this is not just people that, you know, this would actually be people saying I am Christ, but from that perspective, not like claiming to be, because what's going to come near to deceiving the very elect is not somebody's 
trying to pull off being the being Jesus. But it's going to be some kind of well, and even in some of these really fringe manifested sons theologies, it's like Christ so comes back in us. Before he ever comes back in person, he comes back in us. Listen, if he hasn't all if he's not already in us, we're dead and outside of him. You know, I mean this is there's some hairy stuff out there. So yeah, I believe that's the kind of deception. These real heady doctrines. I want to keep it, you know, yeah, we're going to a place of fullness. And yes, we're going to be empty and all that, but this, there's some really fantastic stuff out there that just goes way too far. Remember, whatever this will be, however, whatever it will be, it will be nothing other than the gospel. Amen. The gospel. And it will just be a deeper appropriation of that which has been from the beginning. If it's new, don't trust it. It could be a greater apprehension of the old gospel, but, and I believe we're going to have that, and there will be a corresponding power. But it will be the gospel. That's what stops the accuser. Not some special dimension you enter into. You know, it's the gospel. The reason he's evicted is not because he's physically thrust out. It's because revelation has come that liberates you from his access to your conscience. So I hope I just wanted to make that clear. So, so we're not some new end time thing that we're different. You know, I, 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 we, our great safety will be that we hold that ancient faith that our fathers, you know, were martyred over. And if, I, if it's too different than what those guys were preaching, I don't trust it. <laughs> Thank oh, you, Reggie. Yeah, yes. Sorry. Well, uh, also I wanted to say we uh, distributed this uh, dictionary of... Oh, you have a question? Well, you have a question? Well, yes. Um, Reggie, I wanted to ask you something. The seven churches, now the way I've always understood it or read it, way the Spirit helps me to understand each church is a, the body of Christ, the people, mm -hmm. and Christ tells us exactly in each church what these people are like and what's coming to happen to them. But just on the church of Philadelphia, the tribulation, what the so-called, I don't, I don't believe in the rapture. So, you mean pre-trib rapture? We all believe in a rapture. Right. Right. <laughs> but what I feel that this is church of Philadelphia, the way I truly feel is that I'm going to say I'm part of the church of Philadelphia. I hope I am. That the last hour, the trial, I think God is speaking to us who have been faithful up until the end mm -hmm. and throughout the tribulation mm -hmm. that when we are cornered that things may miraculous, miraculously happen you know guards may pound the door down come in to take us out and the lord may blind all their eyes we're there and they see nothing well that's right you're yeah. talking about preservation though right. not that's necessarily true. removal oh, yeah. right. not removal but preservation but would, could this not be that I will keep you from the hour of trial, like a preservation for us during this time. Could it well, be this? Look this? at the many that he doesn't keep in some removal type of way for one. I know you're not just talking about removal, but the Jews make it through all the way through and they see him and they pierce an entire, an entire third of the nation. And they didn't have to be removed. They didn't have to have special, you know, I, you know, we said that this morning we were talking about the, um, those that will be praising God in the fires, they'll be, they'll be fired and you won't be burned. You know, there'll be supernatural deliverance, but I think you're being protected from something. This sounds pretty fatal. This sounds like if you're not particularly preserved or protected, that you end up with earth dwellers. You end up with their fate. And so this is, this is God keeping you in an hour where you don't, you know, I hope you're not planning to overcome on your own. You know what I mean? Of course, I, I know you're not. But I'm saying God is our keeper. He's keeping those. The reason that we are kept and the reason that we overcome is because he's kept us because of a weakness and a dependency on him. We're not, we're not coming into this time in our own resolve or our own discipline. It's, 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 it's absolutely cast on God. And he's going to protect us from the, all the deception. And even at the very end, I think at the very end, it talks about a valley of decision that there's a real intense time of testing for the nations. And, and I think at that time, there's going to be an awful lot of deception that will probably be fatal for many. And I think he's saying he's keeping us from that. But okay, for the moment, if it's not deception, then certainly it's preservation. And I'm saying even if it was absolutely removal, because the church will be removed. There'll be Jews getting saved at the same time you and I are being translated. Uh, so, because it says that when they're looking upon him and they pierced, that's exactly the same time that 
that the trumpet is sounding for the church that's translating us. What's translating us is quickening Christ to their hearts. And that's the mystery. So what I'm saying is we will be removed. This could conceivably have to do with physical removal. I'm not saying it doesn't. I'm saying what would be unreasonable is to make it seven years. You know, so it would be towards the very, very end. And so the test that's testing the whole world will escape. How we escape it is, you know, it's how you, how you would interpret kept from the hour. Does kept from the hour mean not anywhere in it at all in time or on earth? Or does it mean being kept from the power of the hour? In other words, the, the deception and the, and the peril of that final ch- trial. Okay. Sister, yes. Well, you can see me from my angle through the whole set of Well, still the three and a half. You know, there's, there's, the, there's the pre-wrath view, which it still argue, argues for sort of a two-faced type coming. And I don't, I don't like it, but... But it's certainly not going to keep saints from being vigilant and ready. I mean, if you're pre-wrath, I get along with you pretty well because you're going to see these days, you're going to be involved in these days. You're not looking for an exit. So I do prefer pre-wrath to pre-trib. It doesn't satisfy my reading of Scripture. But I, you know, here's what we're saying. We're coming to the very final hour here. This is the great day of God. The very time the wrath of God is being poured upon the wicked. We're talking about the final bowl. It's absolutely the same time we've already been raptured. We, we're raptured before the wrath is poured out. But I'm, what I disagree with is the idea that the wrath happens over several a period of months or days. I believe the very moment we're raptured, the, 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 the wicked are getting their last installment of wrath. Right. So the same coming of Christ that brings the wrath just got through translating us, put it that way. And there, there's a lot of things that we had a long time that really line up there. And uh, so I think the pre, pre-wrath rapture has a lot of the same problems that the pre-trib rapture has. Only the thing of it is, those who believe that, thankfully, are going to be vigilant and aware and, and, and part of this with us. You know, they're not looking for something. So, you know, they're not talking about an exit. They're going through the tribulation. They just don't believe. They believe the wrath is an entire long period of time. It's stretched way out, you know, over some 30 days or something like that. I disagree with that. So you're saying it's not as dangerous. Yeah, in other words, a person could believe in pre-wrath and still know the bomb. You know, they could still be wit- vigilant witnesses at that time. Could still be, as we've been talking about, straightened and narrowed to that utter crisis of you know urgency with God that's going to have the, such a a moving effect on the church to bring us to a place together corporately, which is what we've been talking about. So a pre-wrath brother would get in on that. But a pre-trib brother, of course, I believe the true sheep of God are going to adjust, you understand. And I believe we have many pre-trib brethren. I think it's a deadly, dangerous lie. It's disarming. It's sad. And there's a lot of things being lost through it. But not all lies are fatal. You get a wrong gospel, you go to hell. You get a wrong eschatology, well, you might lose a little something. Uh, It may not even be a little, but in other words, it's not fatal. It can be. When these days come to persist in a lie resolutely against the evidence of a very strongly supported prophetic voice then you're really revealing something in the heart that, is pretty, that, that does show a fatal deception. So, what, so I'm just saying God is not as fully, he's already calling for it, but he's not as fully requiring of the church a clarity on this issue. But as, as we get near the days, there's going to be a lot of decisions made, especially when things are clearly, signal events are clearly happening and people are dismissing it arrogantly. Oh, that's going to end up really costing. So, there's a, there's a, so what's right now this is why this is a time for patient instruction and giving everybody an opportunity to consider other alternatives and, and, and with patience and grace. But there will be a time when they've gone too far. It's time now, brother, to drop that stuff. Right. We're going somewhere with the Lord together, and, yes. and that's a lie. And you're, dis, you're diverting and deceiving and disarming the body of Christ. Now you're a culpable. Now, now what was once kind of winked at is becoming very required. So, Good. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Reggie.